and we're going to learn about what the process was leading up to the making of the machine. Before I get going with that, can I ask a couple of questions? Could you raise your hand if you've played the Pulp Fiction game downstairs today? Yeah. Okay, and can you keep your hand up? And anyone that's played the game elsewhere, could you raise your hand? So, it looks like pretty much everyone's had the chance to play it. That's great. If you can see down the front, we're very fortunate um, to have some raffle prizes tonight, which will be drawn at the end. Uh, courtesy of Chicago Gaming, we've got a play field that was actually used in the development of the game. And then we've also got a translite from the game. So, without further ado, let's talk about the team that brought us the game. Um, we're going to talk about the, uh, the relationship between play mechanics, um, Chicago gaming, and Raw Thrills. But even before that, what I would like to acknowledge is that we kind of got the band back together on this one, in that we see George Petro back again with Mark Ritchie, having worked ooh, best part of 40 years ago together to bring us Road Kings back in the mid 80s. So. <laughs> So, without further ado, I'm going to ask each member of the team to introduce themselves and tell us what their history has been in pinball and their contribution to this game. So, George, would you like to kick off? Sure. Is this working? Yes. I am George Petro, and Gary pronounced it <laughs> Very good. Um, and I am president of Play Mechanics, and um, I have been in the industry quite some time. I started at Williams Electronics in 1983 and started out at the bottom, which was great. But I, I got a chance to meet Mark <laughs> Sorry. That's, there's only one. Yeah. Oh, this, oh, here's one. Let's, let's try this one. Hopefully it doesn't shock me to death. Um, so yeah, I started back in uh, 1983 at Williams, met Mark Ritchie, um, did some games there, turned into, bought Midway, turned into Midway, did some games there, and uh, started Play Mechanics, did some more games. So um, now I'm back to pinball. So that's me. And just want to say, uh, yes, Mark and I, Mark gave me my first shot at actually programming a game, which was not wise on his part, but I'm super, I'm super uh, thankful that he did, and we're still together today, so that says something. And I just want to give a quick shout out to Chris Graner, who was also on the Road Kings team. And uh, yeah. And just so you all know, Road Kings was his very first game. So just, just saying, a lot started there. I'm Mark Ritchie, and you're not. <laughs> anyway, you guys know my history, I think. I've been in the games industry since 1976. Uh, worked at Atari for three years. Then came to Williams Electronics in 1979 and was a technician there for a uh, year and a half, two years. Then I got a start as a game designer. Mike Stroll gave me the opportunity to design a game. The game was Thunderball. Came out barking, was a dog. It was a bad game. Anyway, everybody's entitled to at least one. I think that was probably my worst game. But did lots of games there, um, most notably Taxi, Indiana Jones, Fishtails, Chris Graner again. I have to put my, take my hat off to him. He worked on all three of those. Um, Diner, uh, a lot, a ton of games over the years. So, And then, you know, I, after that, I kind of left Williams, went to Capcom. Um, was there for about four years. Uh, had some success, built Kingpin, designed and built Kingpin. Um, never got sold. Nine samples were made. People loved the game. Who knows what happens to it now. From there, uh, went to IT. Was at Incredible Technologies for seven years. Again, Chris Graner was there. <laughs> um, uh, I did a uh, video pinball. You may have seen it. Uh, Orange County Choppers, 
also a dog. So that's two dogs. <laughs> Sorry. Did not work out. You're not selling yourself here. I don't, well, I'm not going to sell myself on that pretense. It was horrible. <laughs> anyway, uh, since then, uh, I got back with my buddy George over here. I was producer for Big Buck Hunter while IT was building that, so I was working between IT and play mechanics back and forth. It was a fun job, sort of. On, on the play mechanic side, it was fun. The other side, not so much fun. But anyway, I left there in 2005 and joined Raw Thrills and was there for a year doing more Buck Hunter stuff. Then I moved to play mechanics and was doing more Buck Hunter stuff. And then this opportunity came about, <clears throat> I hate to say it, 10 years ago. George steps up and says, hey, what do you think about doing a pinball? That's about how much time passed. And I went, yeah, I'm in. Let's do it. And uh, that's where I'm at today. So. I don't think I'll be that long. So uh, I'm Scott Pekulski. I'm the artist on Pulp Fiction. And I started in, I think it was 94, at Capcom. And I worked with Chris Graner. <laughs> And then uh, from there, I moved to Konami, did some, a few games that weren't very good. And then I went to Midway and did Carnival. And that was a big highlight there. And from there, I, we did a little consumer stuff. And then I moved on to Play Mechanics in 2003. So, and I've been working there ever since doing Redemption and video games and uh, mostly in the design and conceptual. And now, this, I had an opportunity to do this, and it was just one of these once-in-a-lifetime things. So I was very excited because I, in art school, I was an illustrator major. So that's I was finally get a chance to use my skills. So that's it. I'm Josh Sharp. My dad worked with Chris Graner for quite a while. <laughs> I've been in the. Uh, pinball world since I was a fetus, so I don't really remember ever not being being in it. Uh, real life, I am the chief financial officer for Raw Thrills. I joined them in 2006, and when I learned about this game from Eugene, they were, George and Mark were already well on their way, and I just started bugging Mark a lot. I, I actually went back through and I sent, and within the first 72 hours that I learned about the project, I sent Mark 17 emails <laughs> with with real suggestions and asking him for stuff. <laughs> and fortunately, Mark uh, didn't tell me to go away. So I've kind of just been hanging around ever since. And it has been, for me personally, a dream come true to just get to hang out with these guys who, as a kid, you know, th these guys are my idols. Chris Graner, also one of my idols. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, I still don't feel like I deserve to be with these guys. I still look up to them so much. And shut up, George. I'm done. George, can I turn to you now? Could you explain the relationship between the parties involved? We've got Raw Thrills. We've got Chicago Gaming, and we've got Play Mechanics. What's the connection between the three? Great question. Um, so Play Mechanics is actually, well, not older than Chicago Gaming, maybe technically by name. But Play Mechanics, I started in 1995 and struggled for many years to uh, pay people and make games. And um, in 2003, my good buddy Eugene Jarvis started Raw Thrills and uh, did not struggle to pay people and make games. And in 2006, we, we uh, went to dinner one night and um, decided we should probably put the companies together because we, had a, lot of, we were, had a lot of potential, but no money. He had a lot of money and a lot of games and stuff, but just needed more. So um, we did that in 2006. So um, Play Mechanics is, is owned by Raw Thrills. Um, and so we, we work together. Roth Rose does all the manufacturing for all of our games, for Roth Rose and Play Mechanics games, but we maintain two different offices. Um, we have two different cultures, and we 
definitely would have never done pinball if the play mechanics office wasn't open, right? Yeah. Would you say? So um, that's us. Rothwell's a play mechanic, so we're a unit. And then Chicago Gaming, of course, everybody knows them as a manufacturer of arcade games. And then um, Doug, who owns Chicago Gaming, um, started doing the remakes. And I remember when he came out with Attack from Mars remake and seeing it at the show the first time and really, really kind of marveling at what he had done and always had a lot of respect for what he had put together and the quality that he put into those games. So um, when it came time to, uh, you know, I don't want to get too forward in the story, but I went to Doug, it, Mark and I decided to go to Doug to buy parts for putting together what was going to become Pulp Fiction. And Doug would deliver them himself in his car and he would say, what are, what are you guys doing here? Uh, what are you guys doing around here? And he'd sniff around, he goes, don't get me wrong, I want no part of it. That's what he said. So I'll just leave that there. We'll, we'll pick that up later. So Chicago Gaming is the manufacturer um, of Pulp Fiction. But more than that, they were a design partner in just, there's so many different decisions that went into the game. And, and um, Doug loves to push boundaries on a lot of stuff. And he, he was definitely one of the major design partners. And more than just a manufacturing partner, but a design partner in the game. Oh, sorry. You know what? I, I saw that out of the corner of my eye. I'm just going to say the other team members because they're on there. So Dave Thiel, of course, everybody knows Dave. Um, Dave was our, our sound guy on the project, and it was awesome because I'd never worked with Dave before, but he's amazing. Um, and then Eureka des Design is Pete Petrowski, who used to work at Williams, and Bally, and um, Pete did all the mechanical engineering for the game. Um, and then, of course, Chicago Gaming. And funny story about Pete was we invited him in to ask him if he would do our mechanical engineering. And I didn't tell him what we were working on. And when we said pinball, his face literally dropped, like, down. And he goes, you're not serious, are you? <laughs> so he did a great job, too. So if someone is buying a Pulp Fiction game, who are they buying it from? Are they buying it from Play Mechanics? Are they buying it? buying it from more thrills or Chicago Gaming? I love these questions. Um, Chicago Gaming. So Chicago Gaming handles all sales and distribution of the game, you know, pushing it out to all the, the different resellers. So you would go to Chicago Gaming to buy it. So a question for the audience. Is there anyone in the audience that may have ordered a Pulp Fiction game? One or two hands going up. So when are they going to get it? <laughs> Talk to Doug. <laughs> should, we, should we move on then to the, the... I don't know. I've got mine. I have mine. <laughs> <laughs> I got mine too. We're, we're doing all right. I have a game. So, let, let's see. How did the project come about? How did the project come about? Um... I, I don't want to dominate the whole conversation, but I'm going to go through these key dates real quick because I went back through my emails and I'm literally the only one that knows all these dates. So the project came about because we were approached by somebody, an uh, entertainment, a licensing agent for Miramax that said that Quentin Tarantino wanted a video game and we make video games, so we're in. That was September of 2013. So we had our first meeting with Miramax in October. In December, Scott and I got to work on a video game concept that we thought was really, really cool. And we um, presented that. And after we presented it, in February of 2014, uh, the conversation turned to, no, Quentin wants a pinball machine. So, OK. <laughs> now what? Um, in May, I had to talk to Eugene about it to see if he wanted to do pinball. And um, he was into it, and he wrote me a, a nice Eugene email. I was going to read it tonight, but we'll run short on time. It's really funny, um, but in only Eugene speak. So we decided to do pinball, and then Mark jumped in in July of 2014 to start designing a pinball. And everybody knows what pinball looks like these days, so we went about designing a pinball that looks very much like a contemporary machine. You can see it there. Uh, it'd be great. We could play movie clips. We could do all that kind of stuff. Um, in August of 2014, um, we showed that to Miramax, not to Quentin. 
and they shot back that it needs to have those retro feels. That does not. Um, so we kind of didn't know what to do at that point. Uh, in October, we were actually, we were talking about this last night, um, we got word that another company was looking to license Pulp Fiction. Are we going to do anything? And then in 2014, we got the news that the game had to be a retro game from Quentin himself. And we said, we are out. We're not doing this game. So that was December 2014. I don't know what happened in between 2014 and January of 2017. <laughs> but I got a phone call from Eugene. And he said, hey, remember that Pulp Fiction game? I, I said, yeah. And he goes, what are we doing with that? I said, oh, we decided not to do that like two years ago. He goes, well, I think we should do that. So May 2017, I picked up on working, uh, working the license again. License was finally signed in July 2017. October 2017, Josh comes on board and writes rule set number one. I don't think we even had a game yet. Um, January 2018, we had a new concept. Uh, Pete Petrowski came on board. February 2018, feedback from Quentin. More changes. Um, we got put the Pulp Fiction in the middle of the play field. We didn't have that. I don't know if you even have pictures of those. We didn't have that originally. But I would say by May of 2018, the design resembled what you see today. It had some small differences, but pretty close. So we submitted that. And by September 2018, we had no response from Quentin. But we decided we're just going to do this. We're not even going to we're just going to go for it, right? Oh, yeah, that's the original play field right there. No, no Pulp Fiction in the middle, more character-based. Um, so we just uh, started going forward. Oh, by the way, at that time, it was decided that I was going to program it. So I got a new job at Play Mechanics from, I got, I got to, yeah, uh, me. <laughs> I didn't want to bother our other engineers because they were busy with making video games, and I thought that this had the, probably 50% chance of being viable. So I figured I would just do it. And you know, Mark and I could at least get it to a point where we could prove whether it worked or not. And uh, that was in 2018. February 2019, Quentin finally responds. Um, so what is that, um, like eight months? That's really hard to work when people don't respond for eight months. Um, and he said he hated the back glass. So that's what we got out of that. Do you have a back glass picture, Butch? Because that was uh, what Scott did was the original um, movie poster as the back glass. And he hated that. He said never wanted to see it again. And he actually asked us, do you want one of my artists to, uh, to do a back glass for you? And they made, us send, they made us send Scott's CV. Like, who is this guy? Like, what, is he any good? And I, and I remember talking with Scott about it. He's like, what do I do with that? And it's like, well, first of all, make a CV. So you can, uh, you can, uh, yeah, exactly. next question, resume. Um, so anyway, uh, Scott did what he does best. He, you know, conceptualized what became a great um, back glass. But uh, moving on, March. Can we just say uh, the first draft of that back glass? Oh, I think, yeah, I think Bush has it. Sorry, Butch, Butch's presentation is in order, and I'm just destroying it. There, oh, that's awesome. Ship it. Actually, that's, it's important to see that, because that's what we talked about, was having that big centerpiece, you know. The, yeah. The original one had, like, almost like a poster. I made the poster in the middle and more photographic uh, heads of, around it, and that, that's what he did not want. Yeah. So he wanted it more like a, a, a vintage vibe. So I went back to look at old vintage games and kind of emulate that feeling. And that's where that came from. Nailed it. Um, OK, so March 2019, rule set 2.0 is created. Rule set 2.0. I had to throw out rule set 1.0. That's just the beginning of it. Yeah, right? It, literally, the rules document is like 75 pages. Um, that's jo that's what Josh brings. Most it's awesome. Really yeah, it's uh, uh, April 2019. New back glass concept sent. May 2019. <laughs> May 2019. Chicago Gaming jumps on board. 
August 2019, QT approves the back glass. When you say QT, were you talking to him or? No, to the channel of communication. His assistant, okay. always. QT does not carry a cell phone. So, oh, so who was making the decisions? It's not like other yeah, oh, instances no. where there's a team that. Yeah, yeah, he was. Made, it had to go to him. Um, and then I'll cut this all short. March 2020, COVID. Mm -hmm. And then QT finally engaged with us because he had nothing else to do. <laughs> Literally, productions were shut down. Um, you know, I, I know, yeah, there you go, COVID. Uh, that's my basement, actually. Um, we can all have our feeling about COVID, but if COVID wouldn't have happened, uh, I don't think Pulp Fiction would have happened. It literally went from just us batting a ball around and watching lights turn on to, oh, George has time to implement these complex rules that Josh has written. And we, w we worked remotely, but we, every night we would meet. Like I, my goal was one rule a day, <laughs> one rule a day. And uh, we would meet at night on like whatever, Zoom or whatever, we would meet Sometimes we'd get together with our masks on, but every night we would meet on FaceTime or something, and Josh would go, aim, aim the camera at that. What, what are you doing there? What's that? Why is that light turning on? And we literally uh, fashioned the game during that time. And then in July, or July of 2020, Dave Thiel got on board. And um, I'm going to leave it there because then we made the game. And well, we talk, talking of the game, can I bring you in, Mark? Could, could you tell us about your experiences of evolving the play field? Sure. Um, initially, I was kind of bummed out. I, you know, was not, I had this great, like, wide body design and cool ramp shots and a screen and everything that I thought was going to be, you know, now. And <laughs> shot down. No. <laughs> All gone. Redesigned the play field from scratch. Bottom up narrow body but we started to get it right when we figured out the whole theme that made it a lot easier for me somehow when I knew that we were doing this retro thing I, I you know I just I checked out a bunch of older games you know the inline targets kind of came off of eight ball deluxe I was that inspired me there uh, the top center hole a lot of that was um, out of old again old valley machines that I had seen you know and um, one thing I did have from the beginning on both versions was the briefcase. That was the first feature for the game, and it stuck with it all the way through. And I yeah. thought it was going to totally suck. I remember that. I go, this is never going to work. Right. You remember always that? say that stuff, though. <laughs> you always do that. It's so cool, though. He doesn't like anything until he sees it work. And he's like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, this, is, this was our first... Uh, well, Originally, I had it on the other version up in the middle of the play field on the right-hand side, kind of where the idol was on Indiana Jones. But <coughs> after getting with Pete, we decided it would be much better in the back rear corner, on right corner. And then we were able to do the lock mechanism and everything behind the back panel, which was really slick because Quentin had laid down, I don't want any ramps on the game. I don't want anything like that. It has to be this old-looking, you know, flat game. So... It actually is a multi-level game. It has, in my opinion, three levels. Main play field, a subway, and then that shot to the briefcase. That makes three. And they're all hidden. And we never heard a word from Quentin about it. He was cool with it. So we kind of, you know, we kind of read through that. And, hey, man, we're going to have cool stuff on this game regardless. You may not see it, but it's there. So from that, it was, it was pretty easy for me. I mean, we just got into the rules and... You know, some cool things happened. That's where I'm using the force to get the wiring finished. <laughs> was close, but uh, that was a mess. It was horrible. That was the first, uh, I don't know, George, you remember better than I do dates. I don't know when that was, but that, that way back. That's Whitewood. When I became a programmer. Whitewood number one. <laughs> yep. Programmers always had to write. Yep. Programmers always have to write the, ma the matrices for, like, switches and lamps, so I had to. Mark goes, I need lamp assignments. I'm like, oh, I guess I'm programming. I'll make lamp assignments for you. I and think then, then he did that. <laughs> oh, you would have mess. The, I, I think the coolest thing for me this time around was getting, you know, getting back into pinball after a 27-year hiatus. 
I was pretty nervous about it at first, you know, but once I started doing it, it all kind of came back and it started to be fun. And we were all equally excited about it once we got into the theme and all the stuff that, that comes out of that movie was just like, oh my God, this is going to be, this is going to be kick ass, you know. And I think, I think we did that. And um, I'm super proud of all these guys, especially Scott here for stepping up and doing a first time complete art package, which I think is amazing. So. I had a lot of help. These guys were, were real passionate about it and as passionate as I was. And that makes, that makes for any good team environment, you know. And I think for sure that, that's the thing that kind of hurled me through it, you know, um, after being away from it for so long. So. Okay, thanks for that. So we've, we've looked at the playfield and the design of the playfield. Scott, can I ask you to tell us about arting the playfield and perhaps the cabinet and anything else that you think would be interesting? Well, the biggest thing was the the retro style. I had to ho hold back a lot because uh, you know you look at modern games and there's detail in every single inch of the thing and everywhere and and like on the playfield there's just a lot of blue and I keep looking at the blue and going should I leave this much blue should, or should I put a cityscape here or something? But I kept holding it back because I would look at games and go, wow, there's really nothing on these. The vintage game is very simplistic, so that's that's. Uh, so I tried to, as much as I can, um, put detail where your eye would go, but not have just detail everywhere. And I think, but what I really like the most is the side art. For some reason, I really think that's powerful. I, I always, I wanted it to be a stencil, you know, really bad. And uh, Doug said no, but but <laughs> I was really hoping for a stencil. I thought that would have been really cool. Um, but uh, you know, I had a, had a ton of fun doing it, and uh, and that's pretty much it. We provided with a style guide like other um, people get. Very minimal, very minimal. So um, it, it was more in the exchange of comments, was it, rather than any? I just, I just did it more on my own. Like th they were not. It wasn't a. <laughs> there was no conversations. You know, it was kind of like. I dug down and I, you know, I looked at stuff. Uh, like I looked a lot at the Captain Fantastic back glass and all the little interesting things that were going on. And I tried to put a touch of that in there. Like, well, the people, everybody in the background's in the movie, and uh, there's all a bunch of little details. Like every bottle has something on it that says something, and um, little secrets here and there. They're all hidden all over the place, and. Uh, I thought that was cool in vintage games when you do stuff like that. Okay, so we've covered off all the major elements that go into making a game. All you've got to do now is build it. When did you get to the point where you had something ready to deliver to Quentin Tarantino? Um, October 22. October 22. We, we thought, so a year ago, we were on the precipice of bringing this game. We literally had games ready to come to Pin Expo. But we had, number one, an expiring license because it had taken so long to do all this, right? It expired in December of 22. <laughs> so we had an expiring license. We had no approvals. So, you know, I was losing a little bit of sleep over the summer, just like, you know, this could go really bad. We spent about, we'd spent, how much, Josh? You're the CFO. We'd spent a couple million dollars so far, so you know we had no approvals and nothing, and so a little bit running by the seat of our pants, but we tend to do that sometimes. Um, and uh, I had worked with Quentin's. I appealed to Quentin's assistant. I'm like, look, I'm in a bad place. We need to get something moving, and um, we literally got people to move for us. But Quentin needed to see the game. We couldn't show it until he saw it. And he was going to be in LA at the end of October. I'm going, well, that timing doesn't really work for us. Didn't really matter. So we changed our plan, didn't bring it out at Pin Expo, but we took a game to LA and delivered it at his house. Um, Scott was with me and uh, my son Nick was with me. That's me carrying the topper because it was so fragile. It couldn't ship with the game. That's through LAX. And then that's me in um, Quentin's basement, actually, um, making sure the game is, is actually working. So there it is set up. You can see all his little tchotchke in the back there. Um, 
And, uh, you know, it's just an interesting story. He was in town. He wrote a book. He was in town promoting the book. He was at Jimmy Kimmel while we were at his house. And it was specifically set up that he wouldn't be there while we were there. And um, I remember uh, the housekeeper started getting really agitated because we, we were actually playing the game. We were, like, having a good time. And the housekeeper started getting really agitated. It's like, oh, you must go now. You must go. And <laughs> we're like, oh, I guess we're leaving. I hope the game works. And really, she was like shooing us out of the house. And we were, we were in the driveway, um, kind of just milling around a little bit, talking. And we, we decided we'd walk down the driveway, because it was kind of up on a hill. And we walked down the driveway. And we don't have this picture. But I go, Scott, get, get in front of his gate. we got to take a picture of this. And literally, Scott kind of gets in front of the gate, like, I'm at Quinn's house. Yeah, he's like, yeah. And right then, there's this car waiting the left turn in the driveway. And Scott gets all the way, and the car comes in, and it was Quentin was in the passenger seat. He's like, who is this? He's like, who is this guy? And um, I guess he played the game, and he absolutely loved it. And right at that point, um, it, it was like everything was good. As soon as he loved it, we got our license extension. Um, we got all the approvals for all the other talent. Everything just fell into place. So um, there, then, okay. then, then we could actually move forward. So we had to reset our clock. So this is the first time we've actually seen the, the topper or referred to it during this seminar. Who's the best person to talk to us about the development of the topper? Uh, Doug. Doug. Yeah, OK. <laughs> And that is that it's, well, I think Mark can talk about it, because it was really Mark and Scott's brainchild, but Doug went over, over the top, no pun intended. Yeah, I basically gave uh, Doug like a 2D sketch of what we were looking for, kind of a thumbnail. Hey, two characters here. Here's the cars. Scott, you got involved in that. George, you too. You helped on that star field in the back. It was George's idea. So this was very much, you know, everybody was all in, and, and we gave it to Doug, and Doug freaked out. He was like, oh. I can make that. I can do that for you guys. I got to see how I know what to do. I got the motors. I got it all. Uh, you know, we talked about how it was. He just, he just, we call it diving into the rabbit hole. And this is what Doug did on a regular basis. With every, anything new on that game, we would lose Doug for three to five weeks, minimum. So this was no different. But. Man, I, I didn't think he was going to do it, but he, he got a hold of like an artist outside to do the 3D models for the characters and then had them cast and then we had them 3D printed and then they're hand painted and all this crazy stuff. And before we knew it, we had it working. It was just, it was amazing. It was just amazing. I remember going, oh my God, this is going to be so cool. And I was, was like, oh my God, another thing to program. It is. <laughs> Every effect I did anyway. had to be rewritten. <laughs> yeah, Doug, Doug um, George was alluding to that earlier. Doug was a huge help with a lot of design elements on that game. And, um, you know, he, he, he again, pure passion. The guy loved what he was doing. And it just, it worked out great. I mean, it just, everything fit together. You know, it doesn't happen on every game. This one, I thought, went together really well from all sides. So kind of a surreal experience, you know. Um, but yeah, Doug is an amazing, and it turns out, accountant engineer, <laughs> right? We have an accountant pinball player rules guy and an accountant engineer. So find your accountant if you want to make a pinball. Has, has a decision been made on whether people will be able to buy the topper as a standalone upgrade? Talk to Doug. Okay. <laughs> Any final comments? On the design before we throw it open to the audience for questions. Talk to Josh about the rules a little okay. bit. Okay. I think that's the amazing part. Yeah. yeah, I think what Scott brought up when he was doing the artwork, like a, the word that comes to mind for this project, and even listening to Mark, is restraint. And I think for me on the rules side, it was. It was the, the, I mean, no lie, the rules doc is 70 whatever pages, and there's a lot of really bad stuff in there because, you know, you. I'm a nerd, pinball nerd, so it starts with something that like only I understand that I think is cool in my mind, and then having to make sure that that it can be something that can be fun for everybody, and more importantly, with the limited displays that we have to work with, you need to be able to, I'm a firm believer that you need to understand what's going on in order to 
find that emotional connection to the player when you're doing things. And I think that is something that, like, 90s Williams games did better than, you know, a lot of the games today still. There's the charm that those games have where you're, you're not hitting 11 shots to, to tell some hour and a half story. You're doing a two, three, or four step thing. And the excitement level, you know, and, and I mean, I can appreciate modern games and being able to take a story from zero to 10. And I feel like the, the magic of those Williams games where they were, they were just like, well, we're not going to worry about zero to seven because that, that shit's boring. We're going to start at seven and everything we're going to give you is seven to 10. And I feel like we did, we tried to do that as best we could with this through, through the rules themselves and then through, you know, what I find more important is the choreography that George has put on these rules that I was at Interim yesterday and like the game was off to the side and I knew where people were in the game just from the sounds that David Thiel had done and the sound effects that George is calling. And that's the kind of stuff that like, I grew up with an Adams Family and Twilight Zone in my bedroom. And I mean, I can, th those moments of like starting seance and hearing, you know, the cabinet knock while my brother's down the hall, like that's, st it sticks with you. You know, I mean, I'm 40, almost 44 now, but that stuff really meant a lot to me in my teenage years, and it still does. So trying to sort of put that into this was my goal. So I just want to make one comment, because Josh undersells himself. It's ama The rules in the game are amazing. And, and that was probably one thing that when Mark and I were talking about doing a pinball, I was like, I don't even know what pinball is these days. I mean, seriously, it's so complex. And I love pinball. I mean, I grew up on pinball the same way Josh did just a bunch of years earlier. Um, but as Mark said, you know, it's supposed to be a single level game, but it's got a lot of stuff hidden in it. The rules are the same way. You play it and it seems, right away, it seems very approachable, but then it can get deep on you quick. And um, we've been playing this game for, well, whatever, whenever I got the rules right in 2020. I mean, we've been playing it three, three year, over three years, and we still love it. So it's a lot of fun. And just Josh just brought a level to it that we would have never achieved if he didn't engage and kind of show us where pinball, what pinball needs to be. So I feel really good about that because we didn't want to make a game that wasn't going to live up to what people are expecting these days because there was so much about this game that was not <laughs> what pinball is right now. I was super worried about the rules, but Josh stepped in and made it. I don't, stepped in is the wrong word. He was the right member of the team that we needed. And it, we're like that. He barged in. He barged in <laughs> and we love it. Okay, you briefly mentioned the sound there. And sound is, is kind of important in terms of setting the period. And we took, we've talked about how Quentin wanted a retro game. So, uh, David's not here. He wasn't able to make it. Could you tell us a bit about the development of sound for Pulp Fiction? Yeah, it was... Uh, that was actually very interesting because I'd never worked with Dave before, and um, you know, Dave. I does anybody know who Warren Davis is? Okay, so you got. Oh, well, Chris does. Uh, everybody, Warren and I worked together back at Williams, and Warren programmed Cubert, and uh, he wrote a book uh, like a year ago, and he asked me to read an early version of it and um, write something for him on it, and I read it. And it had so much about David Thiel in it. And I'm like, wow, Dave goes back really far in the business. I had no idea how many things he had done and how many things he'd been involved with. Um, and he just has so much knowledge. And, and like Josh said, we wanted to get a certain sound and feel out of this game. And I had those same ideas that I, I wanted it to be very sonically like expressive in the right moments. And Dave just knows what that is. It's like you talk to him about, hey, I need a sound for, uh, you know, we're going to be doing a countdown for this, and you're going to hit this target and collect. He goes, got it. And he would, he wrote all the stuff, and he goes, here's how you run this, and when you jump out of it, you do this. And I'm like, this guy, he's right on top of everything. Spinner sound, the spinner sound's amazing, right? There's super, uh, there's different modes of the spinner, and he came up with these really cool progressions. Uh, just stuff like that, he just knew. And we didn't have to try to explain it. And um, it was really, really great to work. I mean, I feel like everybody on the team was really good at what they did. And um, Dave just 
fit that bill 100%. And I have to say, I had to write a whole new sound system for the, I had to write everything for this game because we had nothing, we had zero. And um, so I had to write a sound system and I spent one summer, Leslie, I don't know if you knew that, I was in the basement. Um, I spent one summer literally back and forth, Dave Thiel was my best friend, as we wrote a sound system together to multi-track everything and he told me how he wanted a script and uh, yeah, it was crazy. But I did it and it was awesome. So, so, so at this point, how complete is the game? What more development work is gonna, going to go on? I'm literally uh, putting the final touches on things no one but Josh and maybe a couple other guys will ever see. So it's done, okay. pretty much. Okay, so there's uh, a couple, we've used up all our allotted time, but before we go, we've got two things to take care of. We've got time for maybe one or two questions and then we'll move on to the raffle and close. So any, any questions out there? Over there, yep. Not, uh, not a stitch. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't, you know what, we figured out very early on that all he wanted was a, an art piece in his house, because that's what old pinball was, they were art pieces. It has to look good turned off and turned on, and that's, that's exa we figured that early, so that's what we focused on. Okay, and last question to the guy at the back in the road. Um, probably the easiest implementation I've ever had in front of me. Um, honestly, there was so much stuff in that movie, and the fact that that movie hops all over the place, back and forth. My first, my first thought with it was it's going to make an excellent pinball machine. It, you know, it was a question of how we lay the rules out and where things. Really, I think what um, what really sold it was where we placed all the speech calls. So I think we were really careful about where we implemented speech and how we could best take moments of that film and bring them to life on a play field. And I feel like we did a pretty good job of that game. It's very satisfying when you hear, I can't repeat it here, but <laughs> put it on adult mode and it, it does the job, so. He, wa he watched the movie 500 times to uh, answer your question. Yeah, I did. Okay, Don, Don, can I ask you to come forward with raffle tickets? With the play field in the back class. So first? which do you want to raffle first? What do you guys want us to raffle first? Play field or back class? Let them choose. Let them choose. Oh. 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 Like That's style. next level. That's yeah. next level. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to count. <laughs> <laughs> Are you for higher? <laughs> <laughs> Fair choice goes to. This is dealer's choice. Um, six five eight zero nine zero. Someone gonna come forward. Six five eight zero nine zero. Bingo. Who's got it? Who's got it? Somebody's got it. Must be present to win. Okay. That's, that's just oh, yeah. oh, oh, just in time. Ah. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Table. Here, I think this one's good. Right, it's good. It's good. All right. What's your choice? All boys play field. All right. Enjoy. Nice, nice choice. choice. And, it, and if you care to stick around, the team will sign that for you. Thank you, guys. Just outside beyond the doors. Sounds and for the back class, Mark, can you pull us a winner, please? We should read it right side up, I think. Six, five, eight, one, four, eight. He wants a play field. Yes. No, he wants, he wants production games in Europe. Oh, 
yeah. Okay. So then all that remains is for me to thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed sure. the seminar and found it informative. And thank you to the panel and not forgetting Butch who mastered the slides for us. Thank you, Butch. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh,